I don't know if you saw the uh, the back and forth I had a couple of weeks ago. He posted worse this effect, you know, which of these is more effective? To show up and scream and yell that you're a wicked, evil, murdering person, yada, 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 or to offer a cup of water in the name of Jesus, blah, 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 blah. And of course, all his cheerleaders came in and said, oh, yes, yes, the second one. And I came in and said, well, how about a third option? How about we do this the way the Bible does this? The Bible tells us that, uh, that Jesus comes and names the sin and confronts the sin and calls on the sinner to repent. Uh, he doesn't scream. You're right. He doesn't scream. Uh, but neither is he shy about saying, you are in sin. And they go, oh, you know, show me that in the Bible. I said, well, you show me this nice in the Bible, this nice thing you're talking about. They picked the woman at the well. They picked the, the woman caught in adultery. And I said, look, in both of these situations, Jesus is abundantly clear. This is what you have done. I know how many husbands you've had, and I know the man you're with is not your husband. That's confronting sin. Go and sin no more. That is confronting sin. And by the way, there was no help. There was no, there was, I mean, there was a rescue from the stoning, but there was no gospel presentation. So then I went and said, okay, how about Acts chapter 2? The 3,000 come to faith. Because they, they kept coming back with, our style's working, our style's working. And I said, have you ever seen 3,000 come to faith from your style? We were getting ready to go out to a new abortion clinic, and Robert had had the idea for a long time. He just wanted to make a sign that made it as basic as possible. Babies are murdered here. And so we were sitting around our, uh, our kitchen with a couple dollar piece of poster board and some markers, and my wife and Robert sitting there tracing out the letters and coloring them in. Babies are murdered here. And the next day we went to the clinic and stood out there with that babies are murdered here sign and just saw the impact that it had on passersby and even on the abortionists. It was a simple truth that can be done by anyone and people are finding that out now. If you can buy poster board and markers, you can stand out in front of a clinic and speak the truth about what's happening there, maybe even intervene to save people's lives. So that's beautiful. Syracuse is interesting because uh, this is the, in 1970 they started doing abortions even before Roe versus Wade, New York had more liberal laws regarding abortion, one of the first states in the country to have it and the Planned Parenthood here in Syracuse was the first Planned Parenthood to start doing abortions and so I mean this is where this is where it started, this is a great place to do abortion clinic ministry or plan, ministry out in front of Planned Parenthood anyway. I can remember being a pastor in St. Petersburg, Florida, and, and I've always been a preacher of righteousness. I was never one of those pastors that shied away from the burning issues of the day in case I offended anybody. When I saw sin in our nation, I called it for what it was. But um, through a series of events, the Lord set me up. And uh, through a threefold witness, he broke my heart and he opened my eyes to the American Holocaust. And uh, I, I preached against abortion. You know, I knew it was a sin. I knew it was an abomination. But, you know, it's something that we argued about, you know, something we debated, you know. But then I saw a film by Eric Homburg, Massacre of Innocence. And for the first time in my life, hmm. I saw the pictures of aborted babies. I saw their little arms and their little legs and their heads separated from their bodies and their torsos. And, and quite frankly, 
it was like my Isaiah 6 moment. You know, I had seen the Lord, and I am undone. Literally, my, my life unraveled before my eyes. In fact, it was so intense, I had to turn the tape off, and I ran into my bedroom, and I fell prostrate before God. And guys, I'm not talking about it weeping. I'm talking about a wailing so intense, my physical chest hurt. I said, we are one sick puppy, and we need to die. How in the world, how in the world did we descend into this place? It was so evil. It was unbelievable that we would do this to our own children. You know, how many believe God's the all-knowing God? Omniscient. Do you know when it says that of child sacrifice and the shedding of innocent blood, he said, I have not commanded this, neither have I spoken, neither has it entered into my mind that parents would do this to their children. So it's not like he, he lacks knowledge. He knows. He's the all-knowing God. He knows, but it's so off the charts. It's so beyond his, his character, his creation, his purpose and plan for humanity that he refuses to put any rationality upon it. In my judgment, abortion is like the doctrine of hell. Hell is real, the Bible teaches it, and it ought to alter the way we live our lives, the way we make our decisions. But I understand that it is such a real horror that the human mind can't really enter into and think on it directly for very long before the very horror just drives you crazy. Abortion's like that. We can't think about it too long because it is just too ghastly. And yet our calling is to enter into, to push that boundary, to go into it. And yet, and again, Christians don't. We don't because it makes us uncomfortable. It makes us squeamish. It makes us embarrassed. And the honest truth is it exposes our sin. Romans chapter 1 teaches that all men know that there's a God, that all men suppress that knowledge because we all know that God is displeased with our sin. That reality isn't utterly undone when we become a believer. We still suppress our knowledge of our sin. And so again, we turn abortion into a social issue, a political issue. We turn it into something to talk about occasionally. We turn it into something that we can assuage our consciences by writing checks to the local crisis pregnancy center. That's a good thing to do. But we can't lose sight of the reality of what's going on. We can't allow our consciences, like the conscience of the nation, to become cauterized by the horror of abortion. Back in July, a woman and her mother drove into the clinic and Brooks pled with them not to kill their baby. They said that they're Christians and that they know that abortion is murder. But they plan on asking for forgiveness later. Brooke shared with them about Matthew 7. You know, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons, do many mighty works? And Jesus says to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. That's the word of God. Here's what they said. We know that. And we're going to do it anyway. They're professing covenant people of God murdering their unborn baby. There are a lot of things you can do wrong in dealing with the abortion issue. But one thing you can't do, indeed one thing the church hasn't come in the neighborhood of doing, one thing you cannot do is you cannot overreact to the importance, the seriousness, and the horror of what goes on when babies are being murdered. What John does is he comes to the mill with genuine concern for the babies and for their moms because he knows they are about to do a genuinely wicked thing. John isn't 
merely screaming and screeching and essentially uh, serving his own conscience by demonstrating how opposed to all this he is. John is there five days a week and John is there, I think, hitting the mark exactly right. You know, the Bible tells us that God hates the shedding of innocent blood. It tells us to be not deceived, that God is not mocked, that whatever we sow, we're going to reap. And that's my fear for you today. We can help you. My pastor, Jim Fitzgerald, uh, took me down to... Uh, there almost nine years ago to the Orlando Women's Center and then ended up uh, two and a half years ago just sitting on the wall there because I really felt a call to be there constantly. I asked God if, he, if that's what he wanted me to do for him to take care of my family and supply and he's, he's been faithful. For 28 months now we've been at the end of every month the bills are paid so he is faithful. He's called me to that place, and uh, that's that. I don't know what else to say. He's just been truly faithful. In Leviticus chapter 20, God made this amazing statement. When a nation gives their seed to Moloch, and make no mistake about it, brothers, those death camps, those abortion mills, these are modern-day altars of Moloch, altars of Baal. That's the biblical reality. And believe me, that spirit is alive and well. Because what was the lie of Moloch? The lie of Moloch to the children of Israel and to the pagan nations, you give that child to me and all will be well with you. Give the child to me, and all is going to be well. Don't you hear it? You're too young, sweetheart. Think about your college. Think about your career. Think about stretch marks. Give the child to me, and all is going to be well with you. And our nation has bought into this spirit hook, line, and sinker. You know, on Wednesdays, you'll have 35 ladies that are here to kill their babies and then the same thing a lot of times on Fridays and Mondays uh, but typically it's been between 10 and 20 a day uh, with some days larger but here a couple months ago they had a free abortion day here and there was over a hundred uh, people here to have free abortions yeah in one day and the one of the workers here one of the workers here told me she was so sickened by it and she could feel Satan himself here on that day and that she had to leave at 86 babies being killed this truly is the gates of hell inside those white doors this truly is the house of lies the father of all lies dwells behind these doors and there's demonic activity all around this place i have to warn our viewers that what you're about to hear and see is not only graphic but horrific i mean jack well i mean the, the babies look. were the, the testimony was the babies were born alive were wiggling on the operating table were crying and he stuck scissors in the back of their That's neck not Obviously, this is a horrifying case where the facts have revealed that babies were born alive, then killed in a manner that is just too gruesome to describe. In case after case, Dr. Gosnell and his assistants induced labor, forced the live birth of viable babies, and then killed those babies. I don't think we understand what abortion is. As we're talking today, not much in the news, but at least in small circles in the news, 
uh, are the grisly details of Kermit Gosnell's House of Horrors in Philadelphia. And there are a lot of Christians who perceive themselves to be pro-life, who have not been particularly active in the pro-life movement, who are getting these reports of Gosnell and his assistants and untrained medical personnel snipping uh, the spinal cords of babies who have been born uh, alive after a failed abortion, hundreds of these babies. I find myself deeply disturbed by the fact that we're so deeply disturbed by this, that this should be some kind of minor awakening in the pro-life movement, because what it says to me is these abortions, these post-birth abortions, these are really bad. And we should be aghast and appalled, and we should hold these up for the world to see so that they'll see how bad these are. What we want to do is clean up and sanitize what's going on. But you can't sanitize what's going on. Because what's going on is the murder of babies. Sometimes babies are killed by being set on fire in their mother's wombs. Saline injections which burn the child from the skin inward inside the womb are typical common forms of abortions. And actually, hideously, that may very well be the least horrific way of doing things. Doctors also go in with implements of death and babies fleeing in the womb, trying to get away from these implements while doctors are grabbing legs, tearing legs from babies' bodies, putting them on the tray beside the table where this monstrosity is happening, taking the other leg, taking the body, the torso of the child, then reaching up and very carefully wrapping those forceps around the baby's head and crushing the baby's skull so that it can be brought out of the woman's body and then put together piece by piece on this tray so that the doctor will know that he hasn't missed any parts. This is normal. This is happening every day in our neighborhoods. And we want to go into these neighborhoods, if we go into these neighborhoods, and whisper and invite and plead. And what we need to be doing is shaming this behavior. We need to be showing people what's going on so that we will no longer treat it as a private, personal issue. We need to remember, even as we look at these numbers, it's not 3,000 a day. It's not 1.2 million a year. It is one baby at a time. My baby, your baby, their baby. One baby at a time being burned alive or being torn piece by piece. One baby at a time. Good morning. My name is Patty. Come on over here. Come on over here for a minute. Psalm 127.3 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. So that means that you are a gift to your mom and your dad and your baby is a gift to you and to me. Because when a person comes into the world, they're the neighbor that Jesus has commanded us to love. We went to a church service and in the bulletin it said, after church there's a meeting to tell you about opportunities to be actively pro-life in Orlando. And I thought, there's abortion clinics here? I mean, isn't, aren't there churches everywhere? And we were going to seminary and I thought, oh, for sure, I'll just tell people at seminary and tell people at my church and, you know, we'll go to these places. And I saw that there was a, a lovely woman who was actually reaching out to the women who were going inside the abortion clinic. And she was calling out to them and handing them some great information and stopping and talking to them while we were praying. And I was so inspired by watching her 
talk to strangers as they were going to kill their babies. I thought, what is she saying? And so I began to pray for her as I was in this prayer vigil. And eventually I started walking along beside her, shadowing her. We, we come in the name of Jesus Christ to do the best we can, to love you, to love your baby, to tell you the truth. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. So we do our best in the name of the one who is the truth to tell the truth. We're gonna speak plainly to you and be honest with you. And we hope that you would do the same. And so every week I come with her on Saturdays and I'd stay five or six hours. We'd come before all the women arrived and we'd stay till after they had killed their babies and were on their way home. And I learned so much from her, but I was afraid to say anything myself. It took me months. So one day, I found my voice and I began to talk to the women as they went in. And I'd offer them information and just try to say the things that Mary said. So that was, that was 20 years ago. So that's when I started. I don't need it. 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 Don't
Park. No, no, you want to put the label on it. You just forgive them and let them know they have another choice. Now, I used to think that people who secured abortions were misled, that they were lied to, that they didn't know. And it's certainly conceivable, though unlikely, but it's conceivable that, that 40 years ago, uh, at the dawn of Roe v. Wade, that there were people who really did buy into this massive tissue argument. But that argument, friends, has been dead for 20 years. Everyone knows it's a baby. It's now being admitted that it's a baby, even by those who are pro-choice, publicly in print, admitted. We know it's a baby, but we still ought to be able to kill it. That's, ironically, some welcome honesty. But if you go to the mill and you talk to these women who are on their way in that door, you don't have to wait for these articles where people are coming out. They knew when you speak to them, they know what they're doing. Their response, even among those who profess to be Christians, is not, it's just tissue. It's not, it's no big deal. It's, I can be forgiven. I have the right. I, I know I'm killing my baby. We all know. They know. Which means that this misguided, poor, innocent, pregnant girl is a myth. This is a heartless woman who may indeed find herself in a difficult bind and whose solution is to murder the baby. in every instance is the premeditated taking of an innocent human being's life with malice or forethought. When someone goes to a place, they, they call ahead, they make an appointment, they walk in there and they pay the person. The abortionist comes along with his instruments of death and he comes in there and hacks that baby to pieces and then sucks what's left out with a vacuum cleaner. I really don't know what you call it. It's murder because you're ending life. It's, it's a termination of life. I mean, we shouldn't even have to ask this question. I don't even know if murder is strong enough of a term. When a mother goes to have an abortion, what is she going to have? What is she going to do? What is she hoping to accomplish? She's going to terminate life. When a person commits murder, they're the murderer. Murder came out of their heart, and when they actually commit the murder, they're the guilty one. The person who's murdered is the victim. Murder and lust come out of the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. God needs to give us all a new heart. If you want to know what's happening to America right now, we are a nation right now in the midst of being dispossessed. Study Leviticus chapter 18, where God goes through all the sexual immorality of the pagan nations that led to child sacrifice and the shedding of innocent blood. He lists that. What did he say? He said a couple of things to Israel. A, don't you dare do what they did, or I'm going to do the same to you. And then he makes this amazing, amazing statement. He said, listen, if a nation commits sexual immorality that leads to child sacrifice and shedding of innocent blood, he said, I will visit the iniquity of the land, and the land itself will vomit you out. Have we seen a lot of natural disasters lately in the United States of America? How many pictures have we seen on TV with our fellow Americans literally with their hands holding the last remains of their possessions? How many? 
Literally, the land itself is revolting against us. Why? Because the shedding of innocent blood defiles the land. It pollutes the land. And how many know God has the power to change the landscape? We serve a God, listen, we serve a God that can take a desert and turn it into a watered garden. He also can take a watered garden and turn it into a wilderness. Based upon what? Based upon the morality of the people in the land. See, the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Uh, we've gotten a lot of signs made, which is really good. Um, what's neat is there's probably about 30 of us here now. And there's probably just as many who couldn't make it tonight who are going to be with us tomorrow. What, what we're doing tomorrow is not an act of civil disobedience. We're not going to block any doors. We're not chaining ourselves uh, to anything. We're not going to stop anybody from going inside. We're not going, we're not going to do, we're not going to do anything in violation of the law tomorrow. They've seen groups, large groups out there before. They've never seen 50 or 60 babies are murdered here signs before. If you cannot abide in good conscience what we're going to do tomorrow, then stay home. We'll still be friends. We'll still love each other. I don't want to cause you to stumble. I don't want you causing me to stumble. But this isn't about any one individual and doing what we want to do. We are on a mission to glorify Jesus Christ, bring people to a saving knowledge of Him through the proclamation of the gospel, and begging and pleading and chastising when we need to, to call out to these men and women to stop murdering their children. If you are uncomfortable with the word murder, do not come tomorrow. All of these people are out here today to try to stop the murder of unborn children at this abortion mill. There are about 45 of us out here today, uh, ranging from about six months to 60 years of age. People have come as far away as Syracuse, New York, Fresno, California, Los Angeles County, Orange County, Ventura County, San Bernardino County, Riverside County, all with the common bond and unity and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a desire to see abortion abolished, not only in the United States, but around the world. Good or bad, children turn out like their fathers. And your daughters were laughing about the murder of children. And then she threw me the F-bomb. A baby in the womb is considered a life by God. He institutes the death penalty for those who would seek to murder even inadvertently, the life in the womb. Abortion is murder. It is the premeditated taking of another human being's life with malice of forethought. And we're here to try to stop the murder of unborn children. Uh, sadly, much of the pro-life movement today, they do not want to use the word murder about abortion, and they do not want to use the term murderer about those who kill their children. But a man who rapes women is a rapist. A, thief, a man who steals things is a thief. A man who molests small children is a pedophile. And a woman who takes the innocent life of her unborn child is by definition a murderer. You are not going to make your life easier by killing your child. You are going to heap pain upon pain and sin upon sin. Having an abortion will not stop you from being a mother. You are simply now going to be the mother of a dead child. Please do not kill your baby today. I had one church 
Uh, friends went to their church. We'd like to start going to the mill. And the, and the pastor said, well, we're really excited about that, but we have one question. Is it safe? And they came back and said, what do we tell them? I said, tell them no. Tell them it's not safe. Tell them they may get spit at. Tell them they may get hit. Tell them they may get soaked with a sprinkler system. Tell them they may get arrested even though they didn't break any laws. And tell them if they don't go, babies will die and souls will end up in hell. That's far more dangerous. We need to stop being middle-class American sissies. And we need to be willing to fight faithfully with the gospel to save souls and unborn babies. We need to be willing to take risks. We need to be willing to look like not respectable members of society. This abortion in and of itself is a curse on our nation. It is a judgment. It's a judgment itself itself on our nation. God has put on us a blindness and a stupidity where we don't even step up and speak out against this. You know, in Waco, Texas, you know, our abortion mill, there was a there was a school, Montessori school across the street, the abortion mill, and behind a daycare center. And everybody's driving down the street as this, this, this Norman Rockwell. So on one side we're educating them, the other side we're offing them, and then the other, and then behind them the kids are playing. And parents drive by. Like nothing's happening! Like this is normal! Are you kidding me? Go there and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Don't let the Catholics take this thing and run with it. Folks, stand up. Stand up. These scriptures apply to us. These, the word of God applies to us. Stand up and do something. It's a curse on this nation. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Amen. He hates it. He hates it. His wrath is against it. Did you ever think we'd ha- see a day in our nation's history when we would see people talking about whether or not our nation was going to default on its payments? Did you ever think you'd see that in your lifetime? Did you ever think in your lifetime that you would see September 11th? I never thought I'd see anything like that on TV. Do you, is God sovereign over this stuff? Yes. <laughs> well, listen, folks. God brings judgment. He's sovereign over the nations. Amen. God was not asleep that day. No, he was not asleep on September 11th. God was not asleep. He was not asleep when this nation is $14 trillion in debt. God was not asleep at Hurricane Katrina. He wasn't asleep on any of this stuff. Amen. He was active. Because this is a national sin that's bringing national calamity upon us, and it affects us all, Christian and non-Christian alike. This is going to have great impact upon your children and upon your grandchildren. And I'm telling you, one of the reasons why I fight against this so much is I'm trying to give God a reason not to curse my children, not to judge them, not to destroy them. I'm telling you, when you're fighting for the unborn, you better know one thing. You're fighting for your children. You're fighting for your grandchildren. You're fighting for your future. Because this is a serious matter to the Almighty. We look at it, we say, look, it's all the renegades that are out there preaching outside the clinics. Why is that? Why is that? Where's the church? I want the church to be out there. I want to see them out there standing up for righteousness. Folks, it is not righteous that 50, we have slaughtered 53 million. It's not righteous. And we are guilty. Their blood is upon our hands because we know better and we've kept our mouth shut. It is vitally important, critically important, and this goes to the pride issue as well. Vitally important that those who are actively involved in pro-life ministry, that they be under the authority of elders in a local church that they be formally, recognizably, everybody knows it, everybody agrees with it, under the authority of local elders in a local church. See, what happens is we get passionate about this issue, we band together with our friends who share this passion, we get disgusted with those in the church who are not excited, and we decide we're too good. 
to be a part of a church that isn't as zealous about life as we are. That's pride. That's folly. That is the path that leads to destruction. We need to first have those who have the passion, who have the seal, who have the feet on the ground. They need to be under the authority and in submission to the local church. And then you will see the local churches begin to wake up and take ownership and, act, and be more active uh, in these issues. So when we have the people who are willing to get their feet dirty or their hands dirty, who are out there at the mills, not a part of the church, and then grumbling about the church, we shouldn't be surprised that the church doesn't have people on the ground. But if we come together, if we who have our feet at the mills are in the church, the church will get behind and get, get supportive and, and we'll have opportunities. What we, we've seen, again, seen that happen here. Multiple families from this church that I attend, where I'm a member, uh, now going and, and visiting the mill and preaching there. Multiple uh, students at the college where I teach who are also members of that same church, going down and joining John Barrows, encouraging him, praying with him, and even preaching beside him. Uh, because, because we did not turn our back on the church in order to serve at the mill. Early, it's about 2.30 or so. It's about 2.30, 10 to minutes to 3, and they left. They left. I've never seen that. Uh, I think they might have had uh, three or four abortions today, which is terrible. It's that easy. It's that easy. It's not the sign, per se, that actually does anything, but it's the truth that's being conveyed on the sign. When you have people standing in front of the clinic saying babies are murdered here and the women that are pulling up see that and they're reminded that the life in the womb that they carry is not a blob of cells or anything like that, but it's simply the baby that they know they're carrying. Their conscience uh, has been, in many cases, been, been pricked and they've turned from the murder that they're planning on committing. And they realize they're not a woman with a body, but a mother with a baby. And um, that's, that's beautiful. Now, can Jesus atone for this sin? For all those who repent and turn to him, most assuredly he can. Doesn't change what happened. Doesn't change the nature of the crime. It doesn't even change what would happen with a just legal system. But it does change the eternity of the person who commits the sin. It's a mistake to think that because Jesus can forgive this, it's not a big deal. And it's a mistake to think that it's such a big deal that Jesus can't forgive it. If you are in Christ, and this is in your past, and you've repented of your sin, and you've placed your faith in Christ, know this, Jesus Christ has fully satisfied the wrath of God on your account. He bore that wrath. It pleased God to crush him, not you. Because God was gracious to you. So please know that. And if you're here today as an unbeliever, and you think, well, God can't forgive me. I've murdered my child. Don't listen to the lies. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He can separate your sin as far as the east is from the west and bury it in the deepest sea. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. God may yet pour out his full brunt of his wrath against this nation. But know this, your sins can be forgiven. It is perhaps the most heinous crime I can imagine. It is the most against nature thing I can imagine for a woman 
who's been gifted by God and called by God to nurture and to protect her children, to instead turn around and murder that child. It is not just an ordinary murder. When we commit an ordinary murder, the other person can fight back. When we commit an ordinary murder, it's not the very fruit of our own bodies. It's a wicked, wicked, vile thing, and we need to say so without diminishing the depth and the scope and the power of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Amanda was a girl that came here and she sat on that chair in the front of the building here and cursed me up one side and down the other, screaming and yelling all day long. A lot of people would sense that as somebody that's really evil and, and mean and all of that, but it was actually a defense thing because Amanda, after God's word worked through her heart, stopped, changed her mind and left, and she just had her baby, I think three weeks ago. That's my baby. I gave her 10 bucks the other day and she said, that's child support, John. Because <laughs> she chose life. He, like, he was trying so hard to talk to me. I was not trying to hear anything he had to say. I was like, bump you, the horse you rode in and on, and the carrier that was carrying everything with it. <laughs> I was not trying to hear it. That was the craziest day. Most, here you are cursing and swearing at me and I'm talking to your mother on the phone and then you choose life. Like, I'll never forget that as long as I live. <laughs> well, um, I came back right when I first had him. I waited, just waiting for, I was waiting to speak to one of his friends, let him know I had the baby, you know? And then as soon as they released us from the hospital, I came straight down here. I was like, John, I have the baby. <laughs> I wanted him to see what he saved. <laughs> Thank you, huh? The things that we're seeing today, you know, with modern technology, these things have been with mankind since time immemorial. But we can get this vast amount of information right at our fingertips. And so it looks really, really, really bad. But you know what, brother? You can look at history and see even more incredible uh, devastation and darkness and despair. First thing I wanted to cultivate in my children was a pious, godly, flaming rage that I wanted them to look at the world, see the scope and the depth and the breadth and the destruction and the reality of sin, and to stand and insist, this is not how things are supposed to be. We need to have a sense of what we have lost and how wicked we are. You talk about corruption. You talk about devastation. There was a 20 year period right before Whitfield and Wesley, get this, where four out of five children under five died. And it didn't make a difference what class. Four out of five children before they reached the age of five were dead in 20 year period. Could you think of the devastation? the darkness, the despair that was taking place in England, and it looked like it was over. And in the midst of that, man, God pours out his spirit, man. He raises up Wesley and Whitfield, and they take the gospel of the kingdom to England, to the United States of America, and through their witness, literally change the course of those nations and that civilization. And so I want the people who see this to not leave the mirror and forget who they are. Not think that having the emotional experience of watching this film is the same thing as entering into that rage at how things are. I want that to be steady. I want that to be constant. I want that not to be a mountaintop experience, but a baseline experience. But at the same time, I want all of us to be able to go to sleep at night and sleep like babies, sleep like children, sleep like the children of God, because we, come, we must understand that things not being as they're supposed to be 
is how things are supposed to be. You know, God ain't denying there's darkness. God ain't denying there's despair. But he says, arise, shine. Your light has come because the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. God has ordained the battle, which means he has raised up the enemy so that we, his bride, could be a help suitable to the second Adam as he destroys all his enemies for his glory, for the glory of his name's sake and for the glory of his Father. And any time you see a dark backdrop, that's when our King shines forth his jewels. We are here for such a time as this, so that Jesus will win. And so this is our opportunity as the Church of Jesus Christ. Go home, keep praying for these people that we saw today. Some of you are already really involved in this kind of ministry at home. If you're not, go home and do this. Even if you have to do it alone, go home and do this. There is a place of death near you. Go home and do this. Please. We're the ones who are gonna bring the gospel to these places. We're the ones who are gonna do it because we're the ones who are going out bringing the gospel on the streets and other places. Whether we want to or not, whether we like it or not, I hate coming here, but we have got to leave. God has called us for this time. He's called us to do more than to stand on boxes on corners and preach. People like John Barros and Patti Smith, who've been alone for decades, dreaming and praying for this day. God has answered their prayers by calling us out. And calling us to do things that we don't want to do. Praise God for the John Barroses and the Patty Smiths who've done it alone for decades. Let's show them, let's show Christ how God has answered their prayers. Let's not let babies be murdered here anymore. Soul, look, your soul lost. Wish you can keep 